du kannst dich ja so gut nicht über den Herd rein. folks how's it going it's been a while right it's been a couple of weeks since we met so it's uh if, i i was even setting up this morning for my live stream and i had the wrong button pushed and so i spent like 25 minutes troubleshooting why it wasn't working what's going on this isn't right so on and so forth rebooted redid this and re-downloaded software and then i realized as i was just about to give up and send you all an email saying hey let's go over to zoom i had the wrong button pushed i had virtual camera instead of streaming turned on it's like ah right but that's all right we're here. We're good. We are all set to go. So um, to start off today, we are talking and we've got uh, Kiana with us. We've got Vanessa, Jenna, uh, Jenna, which I believe is Isaiah and Owen. Great to have you aboard. Fantastic. Today, we're talking about management and uh, how kind of the science of management came about. To kind of introduce this topic, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, oh, there's feedback, crackle. So um, 
let's let's see if I switch to another camera. Um, and uh, gosh, it should look like the sound is okay. Is are are the rest of you getting a feedback as well? Let me know if that is uh, horribly distracting. Let's see if anybody else is getting that sort of feedback. Yes, Serenity says yes. Tell you what, I am going to turn off the mics for a moment and turn them back on and see what that does. Okay, let's see. It's going to pick up. It's going to pick up. All right. How about now? Let's see if we are still getting some crackle. Sounds good now. Awesome. Awesome. I I have a feeling I know what the problem was. I left my speakers on like all weekend. and Not my speakers, my mic, and it probably wigged out. Thank you, everyone. So, getting back to our topic. Um, and by the way, because you guys were so awesome and giving me some input there, we're going to go ahead and start some lights. So back in a previous life, I worked for um, uh, I worked for FedEx, and I was a truck driver with FedEx. So, you know, delivery, right? So whenever you'd see the FedEx trucks driving around, that's one of the many things I did during my tenure with FedEx. And um, the way we would load our, you know, I had a route. We all had routes. I had my truck. And we'd back our truck up to a conveyor belt and all the freight would come down the conveyor belt. And we just knew to look for our stuff. We knew because of addresses and so on and so forth, what route it would be going to. So we would pick up our stuff and then we'd load it in the truck. Me, you know, the driver, the guy, gal who's going to be doing the delivery would load it in our own truck. Um and as we saw the stuff coming down, we could set things up the way we wanted to do our deliveries. We kind of knew our routes. We knew, you know, which parts of town would be heavy at what times. We knew if it was P1 freight, it had to be there before 1030. If it was P2 freight, it needed to be there before two o'clock and so forth. And we would set things up the way that we wanted to set them up. Um, now, this was with FedEx. However, at the same time, um, UPS did it differently. UPS actually had somebody else load the truck. And the person would load the truck according to a load chart because UPS had done tons of studies about what is the most efficient route to take and the most efficient order in which to deliver the freight. And just so you know, you want to do right-hand turns. You want to avoid left-hand turns. You want to take the most direct routes. You want to make sure that you are using the least amount of gas and making the most amount of right turns versus left turns because left turns slow you up. Now, pros and cons on either side, right? My setup is probably not as efficient as UPS is set up because they have computers doing all this stuff. However, I really enjoyed having control. I really enjoyed mapping out my own day in my mo own mind and taking special care of certain customers and basically ignoring others and so on and so forth. On the other hand, with UPS, pretty darned efficient. They could be guaranteed of an issue-free day. Now, why am I talking about this? Because today what we are talking about is management. Why you know, We're basically doing three readings today on managers. Why managers suck and why they don't is what I call this lecture. And we are going to discuss how some of the things that I just told in my story kind of came about and, um, and the logic behind both sides. By the way, Kiana here says that's the way, um, 
that's what I loved about Bailey's moving and storage. I was able to set the truck how I wanted. Yeah, totally. Right. Absolutely. You know, important to somebody who wants that kind of control. All right. So let's play with this. Uh, let's go ahead and get our green screen set. <laughs> Okay. Hey, there you are. You're over there. All right. So let's go ahead and play with this. Um, like I said, we're actually going to do three readings today. Um, first one is from Henri Fayol, okay, a Frenchman, right? Uh, and he did general and industrial management. Now, a little bit about Fayol and the reading that we're going to do with him. Um, he saw a need for systematic training of managers. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about why there was no systematic training of managers here in a little bit. But for the moment, trust me, there was no management training, no training at all. And he's like, this is jacked up. We need to have good, solid, systematic, process-driven training of our managers. Um, he didn't so much come up with the theory of management as he did raise core issues, key issues that needed to be addressed in the training. So that's how we're going to kind of approach Fayol here for a moment. One of the things he said is, the managerial function finds its only outlet through the members of the organization, the body corporate, he called it. While the other functions bring into play material and machines, the managerial function operates only on personnel. Um, okay, so right away I'm in the, there we go. Let's go ahead and push this button. Um, here's what he's saying. A manager's only most important job is to get the organization, the people of the organization performing, okay? Which is to say, you know, if the organization is successful, then the manager is successful. If the organization is not successful, if the people are not successful, the manager is not successful. And so that is your primary role as a manager. Going on, um, the soundness and good working order of the body corporate, the organization, the people, um, depend um, on a certain number of conditions termed indiscriminately principles, laws, and rules. He doesn't like laws and rules. For preference, I shall opt the term principles while, uh, while disassociating it from any suggestion of rigidity. For there is nothing rigid or absolute in management affairs. It's all a question of proportion. This is important, guys. So in the past, and we'll talk about why this was, it was kind of like, oh, there's only one way to do things, and this is the way to do it, and so on and so forth. And these are the laws and rules of management. And he's like, yeah, nah, I don't buy that. I'll give you there are principles, but it's always situational. Throughout today's lecture, you're going to hear the term situational leadership a lot. Because that's what it really is. No two situations are the same, which means that managers need to know how to manage in an ever-changing environment. So it's always a question of proportion, and we're going to discuss that. Okay. Seldom do we have to apply the same principle twice in industrial conditions. Allowance must be made for different or changing circumstances, for men just as different and changing and for other and for many other variable elements. In other words, people are always changing. The industry is always changing. Customers are always changing. The environment is always changing. Let go of the idea that there's only one way to do something. 
Therefore, principles are flexible and capable of adaption to every need. It is a matter of knowing how to make use of them, which is a difficult art requiring intelligence, experience, decision, and proportion. I emphatically agree. Emphatically agree. So it's how you bring the different principles of management to bear in a given situation. And it's not easy. Just so you know, management sucks. I re- I, being a manager is hard. It is hard, hard, hard. Um, and it requires intelligence, experience, decision, and proportion. And the majority of us, when we start our careers, we're working with managers who don't have experience and so forth. It's really tough, really tough. Okay, so he then put together a whole bunch of principles of, um, and everybody is motivated differently. Yes, that is actually really, really, really true. Totally agree. Um, Different people are motivated by different things. So absolutely agree. Um, So now, Fayol had a whole bunch of um, principles. We're only going to cover a few. It's not that the others aren't important or interesting, but we don't have time to do them all. Don't worry. We're going to do the ones that are in the tests and the discussions. You know how that works. So let's go ahead and look at them. Principle number four that he discusses is what he calls unity of command. And unity of command um, basically means, oh, yes, yes. Going to do another point there. Totally agree. I'm trying to find my mouse button. (laughs) There we are. Unity of command basically says, listen, you should only have one boss. You should only have one boss Um, because otherwise you're going to get different messages from different people. Now, you might say, well, duh, obviously. The problem is we still struggle with this. We still really struggle with it. Um, Give you an example. When I was at Intel with HR, HR actually had two directors, two vice presidents, not directors, vice presidents, Richard Taylor and Patty Murray. Richard Taylor came from a finance background. Patty Murray came from a legal background, I think it was. And no, they did not have a shared vision for how to run HR. So we had two VPs giving kind of conflicting, divergent, sort of, you know, unclear direction to the organization. Uh, Many companies today use a system of management called matrix marketing and not matrix marketing, matrix management, in which case you will have multiple bosses depending on what project you're on. So it can be really confusing and difficult to really understand what the expectations are and how to deliver to those. So that's what he means by unity of command. Um, Next one, number six that I want to talk about, subordination of individual interests. He says, listen, guys, uh, all of your employees, when they show up, they have to subordinate their individual interests. And that's a hard ask. I'm asking you to do it right now. So right now, you would much rather be doing any number of things, any number of things. And these are your individual interests. However, you have to subordinate them. You have to push them down so that you can do something for your greater future. That's what school is all about, investing today for a payout tomorrow. Well, in the case of business and employees and so forth, employees have to let go of what they would rather be doing right now and instead focus on what the organization needs them to do. Um, And this is tough. 
right? This is tough. Furthermore, the general interest is lost as people pursue their own self-interest. Some people are ignorant of what really should be going on, and so they're going to pursue their own interests. Some people have ambition, and so they're not going to necessarily do what's best for the organization. They're going to do what's best for their career. Uh, some people are selfish and want to maintain their, their, their importance to the organization so they don't share information with others. They keep it all close. And this is my job. Leave me alone. Stay out of my sandbox. Other people, I say lazy, but they're not properly motivated. It's the job of the manager to properly motivate. And if they're not motivated, they're going to find something else to do, right? So a good manager really needs to keep all these things in mind. Um, set the inv influence. Okay, so um, Zara says set the vision, but influence is a dying art. You know, it really can be. And then Jenna, um, or like when your workplace wants you to adopt their mission statement, but it's your own personal life. This is really good. I like this one, right? This is an example of where it's important to make sure that you're with an organization that aligns with your own values and goals. Because when they say, hey, adopt our mission statement, if it doesn't resonate with you, then you're like, whatever. And that's not where you're going to give your best performance. Okay, very good, guys. Very good. Okay, remuneration. And you're like, remuneration? What the hell's that word? Actually, I didn't know it before I started doing like, you know, higher ed school. Remuneration is basically pay. How are you going to pay someone? Now, you might say, well, gee, that's pretty obvious. You just pay them. Actually, it's not obvious. Pay is a funky, funky thing. All right. Let's first read this and then I'll show you what I mean. Um, let's see. Uh, as a manager, you can luck out if you get a great team. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. All a manager wants is a really winning team. It is, it is so true. So true. Okay, let's read this and we'll talk through it. Remuneration of personnel is the price of service rendered. Okay, as an employee, I render a service, right? Hopefully right now I am rendering some semblance of a service. And in return, Salt Lake Community College pays me. Huzzah! That is remuneration. It should be fair and, as far as possible, afford satisfaction both the personnel and the firm, the employee and the employer. Both should feel like they're getting a good deal. The rate of remuneration depends first on circumstances independent of employer's will and employee's worth. These Cost of living, abundance or shortage of personnel, general business conditions, the economic position of the business, so on and so forth. Let me show you what he's talking about here, because this I think this will be illuminating for you as you negotiate salaries uh, with employers and so forth. So when an employer sets a rate, they have to look at both the external and internal factors. External, you can't control. They can't control. No one can control. These are things like, what's the labor supply? If there are a lot of people looking for jobs, rates are going to go lower. If there are not that many people and employers need them, rates are going to go higher. You can't control that. Neither can they. Geographic differences. It's becoming more and more expensive to live here in Utah. Now, granted, it's not anything compared to other states, but there are some states that you know pay much less. Competition. How much competition is there for your skill set, industry, or health image? right? What's the image of that particular industry at this time? And then collective bargaining, which is what the writer strike is going on with right now. So, um, yeah, and it's like, tell me how to do this, right? Oh, right. 
You, you want to know this. So here's the thing. You really want to know these things when you're negotiating a salary. Now, there are sources that you can get this information. As a matter of fact, I have been known to do a workshop on how to negotiate pay and, and do interviews and so on and so forth. If you remind me, I'll, I'll, I'll schedule that workshop. But you want to know what the labor supply is. You want to know what the market comp is. Market comp is short for market comparison. What are employers paying people for this kind of work in other industries and so forth? You want to know what the competition is, all that stuff. Now, as I said, you can't control that. This is what you can control, okay? Hey, training and education. This is why you're here at Salt Lake Community College. You are trying to add on to your training and education. So you can put those on a resume, right? Skills. All right. Now, here's here's like, ooh, this is a hard one, guys, because um by the way, Zara says definitely get a lot of people uh entitled to more money that yeah. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Um, so when you are in college, and this is no fault of your own, it's no fault of your own, all you think about are grades. All you're thinking about are the grades because we have developed this system that just pushes you to think about grades, 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 grades. What you really should be thinking about is skills. What skills can I acquire? And so training and education are different than skills because you want to really acquire some very important marketable skills. Then, of course, we've got experience. Now, don't think that experience needs to be paid experience for it to be valuable. What do I mean by this? If you have done volunteer work, that is experience. If you have raised a family, that is experience. If you have done some sort of religious leadership, that is experience. We tend to think that the only experience that matters is experience that was remunerated, paid for. No, 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 no. This is why when a lot of mothers are coming back to the workforce and they go, oh, I don't have any experience. I'm like, you have tons of experience. Let's talk about how to communicate that. We can go over that in a workshop. Then you can control performance. Now, one of the things, um, by the way, so um, Isaiah says, lately employees favor experience over education. This is true in many cases, right? A lot of cases, um, employers are saying, listen, so long as you have the skills, I'll hire you. Now, if you want to move up in the company and so forth, that's where it becomes a little bit more problematic. But I don't disagree with what you have there. Um Let's see. Um, performance. When you... Okay, I'm going to come back over here. You really need to take some time and understand what is the value you provide your employer. Now, what do I mean? Trust me when I say that your employer makes more money off of your labor than they pay you. Now, that's fine. If they didn't make money off of your labor, they wouldn't hire you. They wouldn't keep you on, okay? But the point of pointing this out is that you need to understand how they're making that money. You need to understand what is the value of your labor. What are you doing that is providing value to the employer and and therefore is your performance. If you don't really understand that, then you don't have an appreciation for your own performance and your own value. And employers take advantage of this when they're 
negotiating salary. Um, uh, title of stay-at-home mom and household CEO. Yeah, right. Um, childhood development, HR, project management, time management, change management, organizational leader. Kiana, this all comes from me stay-at-home mom. And it says, I was surprised at how transferable my hairstyling skills are for business, especially since I'm customer-facing. Oh my gosh, yes. Hi, I'm Captain America, and I'm here to tell you, stay in school, and that if there's one thing you're going to learn from this class, it's to endure silliness. Okay, so let's talk hairstyling. I mean, I could go on and on and on. This is why I do workshops on this. If you think hairstyling is about hairstyling, you're wrong, okay? Women do not get, I, okay, I'm trying to think of something that guys do and so on and so forth, because I don't want to, I don't want to, by the way, this happens with guys in different industries and so on and so forth. Hairstyling is about helping the pe- the person feel good and confident and bold and like they they're owning it right so like every once in a while my wife will go out and get her nails done and get a pedicure and so forth and get a hairstyle and she's like i'm the shit right now i am awesome right and and this is what a woman in this case, now men do this in other venues, right? But we're talking about her side. This is what they're purchasing. They're purchasing that power, that sense of confidence and self-love and self-care. And that's what you're providing. That is utterly transferable in any number of ventures, right? So great listener. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so these are the things that Fayol is talking about. By the way, one of the reasons that a hairstylist you pay for is because of level of risk and responsibility. This is why you have to be licensed. Okay, the next thing that Fayol talks about is what he calls the scholar chain. I've never heard that word before this, and I've never heard it since, but it's basically line of authority. He says you need to really give some thought to the 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 line of authority, the org structure. Let me show you what he says. The scholar chain, the org structure, is the chain of superiors ranging from the ultimate authority to the lowest ranks. The line of authority is the route followed via every link in the chain by all communications which start from or go to the ultimate authority. In other words, communication goes up and down this chain of command, all right? This path is dictated by both the need for some transmission and by the principle of unity of command. But it is not always the swiftest. It is even at times disastrously lengthy in large concerns, notably in governmental ones. So what's he saying here? He's saying you need to really give some thought to how many layers you have in this chain of command, how many levels, and how information is going to flow up and down through that chain. Now, today, in today's world, one thing that a lot of companies really strive for is what they call a flat org structure, a flat organizational structure, meaning there's not that many levels. There's only a few levels, but they're very, very wide versus a pyramid tall org structure. Okay, let's keep going. Initiative. Um, Let's see, hard work. Oh, I um I call it selling a feeling and end result. Clients don't really care about the process it takes to get to the end result. Yeah, selling a feeling. I like that. And man, we're just pumping these bad boys out today. We got our next one, so <laughs> Yes, flat and tall. Yeah, yeah. Flat organization, a tall organization. Okay. 
Initiative. Employees need to be able to take initiative. Now, when I was loading my truck, I could take initiative. And apparently, let's see, somebody said uh, when um, loading Kiana, yeah, Bailey's moving, you could load the truck, right? Um, where's the head, the CEO? So in the initiative is thinking out a plan and ensuring its success is one of the keenest satisfactions for an intelligent person to experience. Yes, I love thinking out a plan and ensuring its success. That's what I was doing when I was loading my truck. It is also one of the most powerful stimulants for human endeavor. This power of thinking out and executive th power of thinking out and executing is what is called initiative. And freedom to propose and execute belongs to each of its way to initiative. It's in its way. At all levels of the organizational ladder, zeal and energy on the part of employees are augmented by initiative. I could not agree more. This whole thing that you see here with me live streaming and so forth, this is me exercising initiative. Um, it's not because, oh, I'm amazing and wonderful and yada, yada, yada. It's because I love this stuff. And if I am allowed to exercise initiative and try different things and experiment and fail and adjust and try again, then I am going to be fully committed to this job right? Whereas if you have to just kind of follow a plan that somebody else has imposed upon you, not nearly as uh, motivating. Okay. Now, that's fail, Henri fail. But now let's talk next about Douglas McGregor. Okay, and methods of influence and control. Fayol kind of went on saying, hey, you need to apply just the right principles at the right way, at the right time, in the right situation, and to the right degree. Douglas McGregor is going to help us understand what this means a little bit better. But it also means that it's time for a break. So let's take a moment, stand up, and in this case, we're going to do a little bit of juggling. Okay, get this on and down. Um, by the way, I no longer have a um, stool in here. I got a new chair because basically I needed a back. My um, um, my my back was killing me. By the way, Anna says, uh, I mean, if the CEO is at the outer part of the flat, oh, no, no, no. It's just right there at the top. So it's like CEO, a few vice presidents, a few directors, and then the employees. That's it. That's what we mean by flat. Okay. Hey, you know, we've been juggling a bit. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been kind of learning as we've been going along and so forth. But at this stage, what we're doing here is a forward cascade. Now, by the way, if you haven't been juggling, that's fine. Just go ahead and stand up and stretch a bit and so forth. So this is the forward cascade that we have been learning. Now, forward is when we're throwing the ball underneath the ball that came before. If we throw the ball over, this is what we call dropping the ball. This is called a reverse cascade. As you can see, you know, if I'm doing just the normal forward cascade, I don't even have to look at the ball, so I can look right at the camera. But if I'm doing a reverse, I need to think about it just a little bit more. Back when I was a kid, I could do this with my eyes closed, literally, but uh, <laughs> I don't practice nearly that much. So that's your reverse cascade. Few tricks that you can learn as, as, uh, as you get better, you know, you can kind of go back and forth with a reverse and a forward cascade, and that's kind of fun. 
You can do some under the arm stuff. You know, just kind of under the arm and so on. And then you can get into some kind of fun, fancy stuff. Believe it or not, this is easier than it looks. But it's fun. I think this is called a Mills Mess. I think it's a Mills Mess. I don't know. There's a name for every one of these. There's a science behind it and so forth. Uh, it gets pretty darned involved. But fun little hobby. <laughs> Theater actor. Yeah, Burnham uh, uh, joined uh, whatever, the, the circus. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know that I have enough coordination for it anymore either. Um, when I was, when I was living in France, juggling in France, I actually kind of got turned off by the whole circus thing because I, uh, I felt like everybody was just an attention whore, right? They were all performing for the attention and that kind of turned me off a bit, but, um, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I am grateful that uh, you find that impressive. It's fun. It's fun. Okay, let's come on back over here. Let's see what uh, McGregor has to tell us. A little bit about McGregor, um, advocate for the human relations approach. He cared about people, cared a lot about people. By the way, the third guy we talk about didn't care about people. He did. Interest in how our beliefs shape our behavior. He was the founder of Theory X and Theory Y. We don't have time to go into Theory X and Theory Y right now, but it's a really interesting theory. Um, and so that's kind of how he made his, his, his name, if you will. Okay. So remember where before Henri Fayol was saying, hey, you know what? There are no rules. There's no laws about management and so forth. Well, McGregor here would emphatically agree. He says, you know, he was once giving some training, right? And he said, the manual for supervisory training program in one large company suggests that the instructor point out by analogy the example that the principles of organization are like the laws of physics. And he's like totally calling BS on this, right? There is nothing about management that's like the laws of physics. This just ticks him off. Um, he says, this is the problem, though, is traditionally... We've gotten our management training from inappropriate sources, okay? Now, he talks about Holy Scripture and so forth, uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Everybody's read that. Everybody who's into management, I've read it. I've got a copy. It's not bad, right? Um, Book of Five Rings and so on. His, his point is this. Hey, if you want to know how to run a religion, hey, Bible is great. If you want to know how to um, practice strategy in a wartime footing, wartime setting, Sun Tzu's Art of War is great. If you want to know how to take somebody prisoner as a samurai using two swords rather than one, then Book of Five Rings is the way to go. But if you're trying to run an organization, none of these sources are going to help you run an organization as a manager, as a people manager. Another issue he said was what he called the ethnocentric view of management, ignoring the political, social, economic, technological realities of the day. Here's his point. Listen, every... It, the world is not a steady state. The, the world is always changing and it's never the same ever. It's rather going all kinds of different directions. And so there are changes in the political environment, social, economic, you know, technological, and all of these things affect how we would manage people. And then a third issue he had was 
What he said was a lot of management practices were based on erroneous assumptions about behavior, you know, being following axioms and dogma rather than really thinking things out. Um, in other words, everybody was managing because that's the way we were always managing. So it's always, you know, you know, beatings will continue until morale improves. Um, versus, well, now, does this really work? Is this the right way to do it? Should we critically analyze? Should we do experiments? Should we test things out and so forth? Um, and, uh, you know, so for example, an erroneous assumption is that more pay brings about more performance. It doesn't. We can talk about that later. But I know that sounds weird, right? Because we all want more pay. But yeah, we want more pay, but more pay doesn't bring about greater productivity and greater performance. However, there are other ways to bring about greater productivity and greater performance. But we send, tend to think that it's all about pay. So he, like everybody else, has pointed out that there's a high degree of interdependence. The outstanding fact Oh, okay. By the way, um, management is about persuading. Okay. From Steve Jobs, thanks to Kiana. Um, management is about persuading people to do things they do not want to do, while leadership is about inspiring them to do what they, you know, thought they never could. That's really good. Um, controversies about uh, returning to workplace. Yes, I was actually thinking that myself, Owen. So a good friend of mine um, actually works for Adobe. And uh, by the way, we got another one of these. So let's go ahead and get uh, Iron Man out there. He works for Adobe and uh, on the people side, and they're trying to get people to come back into the workplace and they're having a really tough time doing that. Absolutely. Um, um, recognition is a great way for someone to feel. Yeah, funny thing. Recognition is great, right? Um, I'll just tell you a story. I'm just, and again, don't worry. We're not going to go deep into this. We could because this is my wheelhouse, right? But um, strange as it may sound, when it comes to greater job satisfaction, let's say that you're offered one of two things. A $20 Amazon gift card left on your desk with a form letter saying, good job. Or the vice president coming by your cubicle or coming by shaking your hand and say, hey, I just heard from so-and-so what you did there that was awesome. I wanted to take a moment and thank you for that. Um, that was pretty cool. Thank you. And then taking off. Now, logic should say the $20 is more valuable, but no. <laughs> if somebody calls you out, somebody of, of influence and so forth recognizes the work you've done and goes out of their way to come thank you, that is what contributes to greater job satisfaction. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the go-to recognition for managers is the usual pizza party, right? Um, but no, the handshake is more meaningful. Pizza party's great. Fantastic. I like pizza. Give me pizza. But that handshake and recognition, oh my gosh. So, um, my wife, of course, does, um, uh, you can ask for a letter of recommendation. Ooh, smart. I like the way you think there. By the way, that just gave us the full, right? That's pretty cool. Um, my wife does um, x-rays um, at a high-end spinal clinic. So yeah, she works with brain surgeons, literally. And every once in a while, when a big mega brain surgeon doctor, one of the best in the country, comes by to her to her um, exam room and says, hey, that, that shot there, that was really good. Thank you. It makes her day. And I'm afterwards, I said, would you, would you give that up for 20 bucks? And she's like, hell no. 
<laughs> right? Okay, let's keep going. Um, the outstanding fact about relationships in the modern industrial organization is that they involve a high degree of interdependence. Not only are subordinates dependent upon those above them in the organization for satisfying their needs and achieving their goals, earning money, um, but managers at every level are dependent upon those below them for achieving both their own and organizational goals. So we need each other. We already know that. A lot of people have pointed that, that out. What's his name? Adam Smith pointed that out, but then also pointed out that managers have more power. However, McGregor says there's a limit to how much power you can impose upon somebody. And as a manager, you really need to understand this. Um, you're limited by your ability to enforce authority. Um, and employees have countermeasures. There are things that employees can do that would really screw things up, and yet they're perfectly allowed to do it. So you can't just force someone to do things, okay? So that brings us then to, well, how do you persuade? And 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 you guys quoted, what's his name? St Steve Jobs, persuading, right? Or inspiring. How do you persuade or inspire people? Well, it's by using power. Now, I want to say... Power is amoral. Now, I want to make sure. Amoral, yes. It actually said amoral in the closed captions. Amoral means it is neither good nor bad. It is not moral. It is immoral. It is amoral. It has no moral value. It all depends on how it's used. In the same way, power is amoral. Whether or not it's good or bad depends on how it's used. So let's talk about how we use it and how we use it correctly. I'm going to skip this one. Um, let's go ahead and do this for a moment. I know we'll get you more points, even though, you know, hell, I'll even do this. Let's go ahead and zero that out. And yeah, I'll, I'll make it work for you. We'll get some more there. Um, why do you listen to me? All right. So think about it. I ask you to do assignments. I ask you to participate and so forth and so on. Why? Why do you listen to me and do as I ask? Let's go ahead and do a two minute write up on that and explore the answers.
Okay, let's take a look at these. By the way, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna just stack this up again. You guys are on fire today, so I am gonna seven, eight. Oh my gosh, they're really coming in. I'm just gonna go ahead and take this up to the three there, and uh, we'll play with some new ones. Plan nine from outer space. That's what that's from. From okay, let's take a look at some of these. Um, let's see. Um, you paid to be here, right? You don't want to waste your money. Um, I I hold power in that I hold the grades, right? I hold the points. I am the giver of points, and you want the points. So this is something that I can use to leverage my influence over you because I have points. I have grades, right? Um, treat you with respect, actually trying to help you learn. By the way, a few of you have said this. I want to go on record and thank you very much. It is, it is, I want you to feel that because I do. I respect what you're doing. I respect the time that you're giving me. I respect the fact that you are being pulled in different directions from many forces and you're investing in your future. That's worthy of it. So I hope you get that from me because it's it's authentic. Um, uh, control over the grades, right? Totally. Uh, respect, enjoy the class and the way I teach it. Gain knowledge. I I have information you want, and and uh, and you can use that in your life. Um, <laughs> you don't fall asleep in watching these lectures. That's good. That's a good thing, right? Um, expand your knowledge again. Passion for education. True to the high regards. I'm willing to take the class. Offering experience. You're getting it. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to show how a good manager can use these things. Um, so let's let's play with this. Um, first of all, let's look at this idea of authority. OK, now you said it, you, I paid for the class. You're the teacher. This is the way it works. This that's the authority side. This, let's see what McGregor says here. The first thing to be noted about authority, it is, it is but one of several forms of social influence or control. It's just one, okay? And by the way, just so you know, I think it's the least effective. I'll come back to that. Direct physical coercion is the most powerful and most primitive of these. It was almost universal a few centuries ago, and we still resort to it sometimes, although its use is limited by social prohibitions in our culture today. Okay, we're going to talk about that, all right? But we're going to come back to it. But keep that in mind with authority. But then he talks about persuasion. Persuasion in its many forms represents another means of social control, where authority and physical coercion are clearly inappropriate. We place major reliance on this form of influence, persuasion. Within management, consultations and discussions provide at least a partial substitute of persuasion or um, substitution of persuasion for authority. Uh, within industrial organizations, managers frequently speak emphatically of selling an idea or a course of action to someone when both parties are fully aware of um, that. If persuasion is not successful, resort will be had to authority as a means of control. Okay, what does that mean? It means, yeah, I'm the boss. I have authority. And yeah, I can do all kinds of stupid, crappy things to force you to do this stuff. But that's not effective. What's far more effective is me try to sell, my encourage, motivate, inspire you to play with these ideas. Now, we both know that at the end of the day, I'm going to grade and so on and so forth. But we also both know that none of us want this to go ugly. 
You want this to be a selling and and an influencing persuasion proposition between both of us. You're persuading me. I'm persuading you. It's all good. Okay. Um, He also talks about expertise, and you guys talked a lot about expertise. Finally, there is the form of influence involving in, uh, involved in professional help. While the nature of this influence is relatively poorly understood, back then it was anyway, it is different from ordinary methods of persuasion. Most professionals, l- lawyers, doctors, architects, engineers, simply rely on authority of knowledge. We listen to doctors because they have authority of knowledge. We listen to attorneys because they have authority of knowledge. And presumably, you listen to a PhD professor because I have authority of knowledge. But once again, it's only a piece. So with this in mind, let's explore some of these, right? Let's first look at formal power, what he calls authority, right? Authority, formal power. There is legitimate or position power, as it's sometimes called, meaning, okay, um, the top of the org structure. By the way, Lindsay says, uh, I had a boss who used his authority in a way that made his job so hard. He didn't want to adapt or use computers. No online. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no online booking. Oh, my goodness. Had to quit. Right. Take all my hair photos off of social media. Had to quit after being asked to take all my hair. So, if you're offended by language, everyone, close your ears. That's bullshit. It's none of your employer's uh, damn business what you do on social media, let alone if it's something innocuous like, oh, my gosh. Mm. It just makes me mad to read that. It just makes me mad to read that. Ugh, that's awful. Okay. So in the case of this class, I'm the professor. So I'm, I'm the professor, you're the students. That's, that's position power. Thing is, guys, this position power is transitory. It is fleeting. It is temporary. Because in three or four weeks, this class is over, and I will no longer have position power. So... A boss or a manager or a supervisor who relies on position power is relying on something that is very, very temporary and has no substance. That's what I think. Okay. The next one is reward power. I can give you something you want. And A. Once again, though, this is temporary because in four weeks, you're going to have your A, and then I have nothing to offer you in terms of a reward. I want you to continue coming to my other webinars where I talk about, you know, resumes and and and, and personal and professional development. I want you to subscribe to my channels. I want you to subscribe to my newsletter. Um, I can't reward you. And so I have to rely on other things. So once again, while this is effective for me as a professor, because you're, check this out, you're giving all kinds of awesome comments because I can reward, but that's going to end. I have to rely on other forms of power. Um, Told me to go to the bathroom and put makeup on. (laughs) Stay in school so you don't have to put up with that chauvinist bullshit. Uh, We have a manager who likes to chew chew people out, belittle them, and so on. Gosh, it's these are people who don't understand the nature of management and power. That's why you're taking this class. Coercive power, the ability to take something away that others want to keep. Um, 
I could do this over Zoom. It would be easier for me if I did this over Zoom. So if somehow or another you ticked me off, I could say, fine, from now on, all the classes are Zoom, and I'm just going to be a talking head, and you're going like, this isn't any good. I have to do the reading, I guess. Um, let's face it, you don't do all the reading because you kind of know that if you show up to the lecture and participate, lo and behold, you're going to get most of the information you need. That's something you want to keep. Therefore, you, you participate and so forth. You know what you're doing. Okay, now, but as McGregor was pointing out, personal forms of power are more effective. There's expert power. You noted here, I'm pointing to the chat there. Um, I have expertise. I have insight. I have experience. Um, and this is expertise and insight and experience that you want to grow from, right? I always have this. And to some degree or another, you may always want it. You might want a referral. You might want a recommendation. You might want somebody to help you start up a business. You might want somebody to help promote your business. You might want somebody who can help get you venture capital. You might want somebody who can put you in front of potential business partners. I can do all this. This is expert power. And this continues past the semester. So this is more meaningful for my my goals. Um, referent power. A few of you were very, very kind enough to point out that you respect what I'm trying to do. You feel that I respect you as students and as people trying to develop yourselves professionally and personally, um, and that you respect all this weird stuff I'm trying to do to make the class more interesting and less likely to be um, uh, soporific. Soporific, it means it makes you fall asleep. Uh, this hopefully will keep you in my network post-class. And then we have network power, right? I know people who you might want to know. Um, a couple of you, I've already connected with others um, to say, hey, you need some help in this area. I'll talk to this person. Uh, some of you, you, some of you might have said, oh, hold on. You know, somebody who works in the people side of Adobe. I wouldn't mind knowing somebody in the people side of Adobe. Let me know. I'll introduce you to him. His name's Nathan. Close friend. Um, so you want access to that. These are forms of power that have staying power past the legitimate. And um, yeah, soporific. It's a good, good word to use. Good word to know. Um, gosh, is that the right one now? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the right one. I was mixing it up with another word. Okay. Um, not going to worry about that. Now, remember, I told you we were, we were going to hear... I told you we were going to hear the word situational leadership a few times. All these methods of social control are relative. None is absolute. The appropriateness of a given form of control is a function of several other variables. Effective control consists of um, consists in selective application to these variables. Um, in other words, and I'm making sure we're good on time. Yes, um, all of these forms of power have a purpose um, and can be used, but they have to be used in the right way at the right time. So, for example. Um, when an employee or a student doesn't have the information they need, I use communication and education to ensure that you have all the information you need. You know what the expectations are. You know how to deliver to what I'm looking for so you can be successful. At that time, I'm using education and communication. Um, participation and involvement. Sometimes students or employees don't feel like they're included, they're excluded. 
Well, I do this whole light bulb thing to try to encourage participation and then bring out involvement and so forth. And I've actually gotten feedback from past students who say they are more likely to comment in the discussion than they are to speak out loud in a lecture room because this just feels safer, more anonymous, whereas speaking out in a lecture room, everybody looks around and so forth. Um, so this is how I encourage participation. Um, when anxiety is high, a good manager should provide facilitation and support, just kind of say, don't, don't worry. Don't worry, it's all good. So for example, here in a, y'all come to this camera, here pretty soon you're gonna be doing a final. It's a big badass final that includes everything we've discussed throughout the entire semester. And I just lost my chair. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna take care of you. We're gonna do a review, you're gonna find. I'm gonna, you know, I've already given you the study guide and so forth. By the time you get to the final, it'll be easy peasy, all right? That's facilitation and support. I facilitate your success by giving you a study guide, making sure everything's covered in it and, and, and support, you get it. Um, you know, sometimes I need to negotiate and so forth, right? On, on what we do and so on. So every once in a while, it's like, um, you need some extra time on something. Yes, I have a late policy, but hey, I'm not a monster, right? Or at least not on Tuesdays. And so I'm willing to negotiate. We can kind of figure out what best to do. Negotiation agreement. Um, sometimes explicit and implicit coercion is part of the equation. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while, I'll have a student who isn't doing the work. And at a certain point in the semester, I'm writing them email saying, listen, it's not too late. You need to wake up and jump in and engage and, and go for it. If you're able to execute to this and I'll give you the opportunity to do some past stuff, you can still do all right. But you need to understand if you don't engage now, you're going to be one of the three F's I give out the entire year. Don't be that person. That's coercion. I'm saying you're going to do the work or I'm going to fail you. Now, that doesn't happen often, right? And nine times out of 10, they snap out of it and so forth. Um, but it, it serves a purpose at times. Okay. Um, when is the review? I'll go over that. I'll, I'll, I'll send something out about it. It's, it's in like three weeks. So I don't have the date in front of me right now, but I'll take care of that for you, Anna. Okay. Our last one. And don't worry, it's a shorter one, but we need to get up one more time. So I think we are going to do some jazzercising.
All right. Good to get up and stretch. All right. Even though the seat is more comfortable than my last one, the butt still gets tired. Okay. Let's finish up by talking about Patrick, uh, not Patrick, Frederick Taylor. This guy's a piece of work. Um, his influence has been incredible and far-reaching, and he influences the way you and I do things more than just about anybody else. But kind of an interesting guy. Um, he's a mechanical engineer by trade, so he looks at problems like mechanical things to solve, right? Um, he looked around, saw no standardization on how workers did things and so forth. Um, workers just kind of did whatever was best for them, nothing standard. Um, founded the idea of scientific management through time and motion studies. Um, took division of labor to the umpteenth degree, right? We're going to talk about this through his time and motion studies. But check out this quote from this guy. Hardly a competent workman can be found who does not devote a considerable amount of time to studying just how slowly he can work and still convince his employer that he's going at a good pace. Well, that's pretty cynical, but he may not be wrong. Okay, so in the reading... And we're going to go over it. Don't worry. In the reading, he talks about how this guy named Gilbreth used his methodology of time and motion studies to improve efficiency in uh, bricklaying. So when you do the reading, it's actually a little confusing. You're kind of like, hold on. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I listening to Taylor? Am I listening to Gilbreth? Am I, what's the deal? Think of Gilbreth's story as kind of an endorsement, right, of, of the time and motion study, you know, movement. So this is what he does. For hundreds of years, there's been little to no improvement made in the implements and materials used in this trade in brick laying nor in the fact uh, in the method of laying bricks. In spite of millions of men who have practiced this trade, no great improvements have been made or have been evolved from many for many generations. And then check this out. Mr. Frank B. Goldbreth, a member of our society, who had himself studied bricklaying in his youth, became interested in the principles of scientific management and decided to apply them to the art of bricklaying. Okay, endorsement stuff, right? Okay, so let's see what he did. He made an intensely interesting analysis um, and study of each movement of the bricklayer, and one after another eliminated all unnecessary movements and is substituted fast for slow substituted fast for slow motions. He experimented with every minute element which in any way affects the speed and the tiring of the bricklayer. Okay, this is what time and motion studies is all about in scientific management. You observe somebody and watch all the movements they make in doing their job. And you evaluate the value of each one of those movements. And if the movement adds no value, you remove it. And you see how long it takes to do certain things and so forth. Um, so the idea is that if you if you break a process down to its absolute critical motions and figure out how to do those motions in the least amount of time with the least amount of motion, then you have an efficient process. Um, by the way, this is why fast food works, 
right? I mean, everything going back there on is Six Sigma Lean. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and uh, in how things are put together in assembly lines, time and motion studies ran assembly lines. Okay. Um, you know, I meant to put a button that makes me disappear so that I'm not in the way there. I'll do this. There we go. Um, yeah, that works. He devoted the exact he developed. He developed the exact position which each of the feet of the bricklayer should occupy with relation to the wall, the mortar box, and the pile of bricks, and so made it unnecessary for him to take a step or two toward the pile of bricks and back again each time a brick is laid. He studied the best height for the mortar box and brick pile and then designed a scaffold with a table on it upon which all the materials are placed as, so as to keep the bricks, the mortar, the man, and, and the wall in their proper relative positions. So once again, he is looking at each and every excruciating detail in this. Um, Zara says, I've had industrial engineers um, on startup programs follow employees with a stopwatch. Yes, yes. They are doing time and motion studies. They still do this today. They are doing time and motion studies. Excellent, excellent example. Yes. Um, continuing on, through all of this minute study of the motions to be made by the bricklayer in laying bricks under standard conditions, Mr. Gelbreth has reduced his movements from 18 motions per brick to five, and in one case, as low as two motions per brick. And that's amazing. And that's what time motion studies is all about. Um. Where have you seen this? Now, we won't, we're, we're low on time, so I'm not going to do the two minute, but uh, Zara says that, you know, seen time and motion studies done. Maybe you have, uh, you worked fast food and everything was pre measured out and so forth. Um, I do this a ton in figuring uh, my whole setup here and I should actually, I can set up my phone so that I can actually show you my setup, but I haven't done that yet. But my whole setup here is so that I can, I am controlling one, two, three, four, five, six. I am controlling six programs right now, all at my fingertips. Now, as you know, sometimes I get the buttons wrong. It happens. But I have six programs with easily three dozen buttons that I try to control everything. And I'm able to do it from this one spot. That's, that's an example of this. Um, so if we come over here, we have um, military, a lot of things for safety. Yes. Yes. Make safety a habit. Yes. Um, feeling humans naturally try to do this, uh, work smarter, not harder. That is what this is all about, Zara, right? Work smarter, not harder. Do this while cooking. Van okay. Perfect example, Vanessa. All these are great examples, but cooking is a great example because in cooking, there's a term called mise en place. And mise en place means that you prepare everything and put everything in its place. Mise en place means put in place. And so you prepare everything, you prepare this, that, and the other, so that when you actually cook, it just goes swimmingly. So that's my whole, so I cook breakfast every morning, and that is my routine. I first get up, go downstairs, and get all my mise en place all set up. And then we go off and do some other things. And then I come back down and turn on the heat. And then it's bing, bang, boom. Very little motion, very little work. Yes, 
Cooking is a great example of this. Let's see, let's get... Uh... Okay, now here's one of the things. There's no way in hell you can read that. Long, get out of the way. Okay, I got to set up another button to get me out of the way. This is important. Think about this. It is highly likely that many times during all these years of individual brake layers have recognized the possibility of eliminating each one of these unnecessary motions. But even if in the past he did invent one of Mr. Gilbreth's improvements, no bricklayer alone could increase his speed through their adoption because it would be it will be remembered that in all cases several bricklayers work together in a row and the wall uh, and that the walls all around a building must grow at the same rate of speed no one bricklayer then can work much faster than the one next to him nor any one workman in um the authority nor has any one workman the authority to make other men cooperate with him to do faster work. Huh, that's a lot. Okay, what does it mean? It means, listen, <clears throat> even if one guy or gal was really smart and figured out all these improvements, it wouldn't make a difference because everybody has to use these improvements for the wall to go up at the same speed. And furthermore, this one guy or gal who came up with these improvements doesn't have the authority to tell everybody else, hey, do it this way. So as a result, the wall will always go up at the rate of the slowest person. And so that's why Gilbreth's, uh, why, why, what's his name here? Taylor says that um, um, it is only through enforcement standardization of methods, enforced adoption of the best implements and working conditions, and enforced cooperation. Notice the word force coming up a lot. Enforced cooperation that this faster work can be assured. And the duty of enforcing the adoption of standards and of enforcing this cooperation rests with management alone. Therefore, as he's often credited with saying, managers think, employees do. So um, you can kind of see the, the push and pull between somebody like Douglas McGregor who says, let people innovate, and then Taylor, who says, no, 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 go out with a stopwatch and a tape measure and then force everybody to do it the exact same way. We're not going to worry about this. Ending on a quote, in the past, the man has been first. In the future, the system must be first. Woo, scary. But uh, there's something to it. There is something to it. Um, the dreaded group assignment and the failed time management. <laughs> yes. Um, guys, really good job today. I mean, your participation was next level. Um, so do me a favor. Send me an email. You know the drill. Email. Uh, here. And uh, it's because I was here. And I, <laughs> that's right. Own it, girl. Um, send me an email and, uh, and we'll take good care of you. I really appreciate the participation today. We've only got two of these left. Um, we're going to I'm going to have to figure out something around a, uh, a review. So I'll get back to you on that. But um We've only got two of these left, just a handful of modules, and then we're good. So, yeah, exciting. Um, as per usual, I'm going to stick around and 
Do I have my picture there? No, I don't. Um, I'll stick around a while if there are any questions or comments or anything like that. Um, yeah, I can't find what I had added in. Green screen transition. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll find it later. Um, oh, yeah, you can totally rewatch these. Yeah. Yeah, Lindsay. And Keanu's right. You can, as soon as I hit done, this thing publishes to YouTube. So all of these are still available. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. As they say, class dismissed. If you have any questions, let me know. If you want to move over to a Zoom meeting, I can set that up. Otherwise, yeah, hour and a half. You guys really gutted through this. I, I appreciate it. So have a fantastic... Oh, why is that doing that? Huh. Well, I'll finish my sentence first. Have a fantastic week, and we'll talk to you again real soon. And in the meantime, I'll try to figure out why this is... Huh, okay, now I fixed it. I have no idea what I did. I told you I have like three dozen buttons down here. Who knows what happened? Yeah, I haven't moved it over yet. I have a slide that I'm going to put up now when we finish so that I don't just f sit here feeling like a tool. Any questions? That's all right. All right. Well, I don't see any questions coming up and I see folks dropping off, which is just great. So I am going to find a button here somewhere. There we go. And uh, we'll wrap things up. All right. We'll see you later.